Mortis Maledictum is a cosmic dark fantasy story, and as such, may contain content not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Now, enjoy the show. Here you are again, prepared to turn the page. You know the risk, and know the danger. Let us begin. The Smithsonian was more than a museum, or even a collection of museums. It was a research facility, library, zoo, worked in art and cultural conservation. It was a large enough organization to hide the collections department's headquarters, safely tucked away five floors on the ground. Alex didn't enter through the museum up above, but through a nondescript office building a block away. Once inside, he took a quick elevator down to the correct depth and walked along a hallway lit with strange purple bulbs until it came to a desk with a bored man sitting behind it. Alex held up an ID card to which the guard lazily glanced at before waving him through. The entrance was the size of a mammoth warehouse, and Alex stood on the very leading edge, overlooking the rows and shelves from the top of an enormous set of grand stairs. Down immediately below him was a large circular information desk. How's it going, Curtis? The man named Curtis grumbled something back in reply, but Alex couldn't make out what it was. Can I get the research key? The information clerk straightened up in his seat, finally paying proper attention. Him call ahead to reserve it, Curtis asked. Alex reached into his jacket and pulled out a small cream envelope. He handed it over to Curtis. The man snatched the envelope out of Alex's hand and ripped it open. Alex watched Curtis's eyes scan left and right, reading the paper in silence. Finally, the man let out a grumble and a sigh. He threw the paper into the trash can on his side of the desk and pulled open a small cabinet. Fine. Here's the key. The room is yours for 25 minutes. You know the warning. Don't go a second over the limit or the Institute is not liable for whatever damages it does to you. He passed Alex a large brass key. It had been surprising the administrators had approved his research request. Usually junior members had to have several letters of recommendation itemizing the merits of the planned research and vouching for the junior's members' poise, credibility, and discipline. The relics in the section Alex needed were ancient and held knowledge that passed out of human memory, possibly for the better. The main floor had all the traffic of the all-self-important people shuffling through with puffed-out chests, but the Institute, the real Institute, was in the twisting corridors, reading rooms, relic storage facilities, and the research laboratories away from the spotlight. He followed the hallway past several turns, leading off into sections and departments Alex hadn't yet explored. Finally, after descending three more flights of stairs, he came to the room he was looking for. Alex put the key in the lock and turned it. The security in this section was heavier than in others. Each of the research sections had their own version of the main hub, but this one was a progenitor. There was a digital clock high on the wall opposite Alex that read 25 minutes in bright red numbers. The seconds began ticking down as soon as he entered. Alex had to clear the next huddle quickly if he wanted any time at all with the artifact he came to see. The junior scholar opened the next door and stepped into a small room with a pedestal in its center. Floating above the pedestal was a large crystal shard about the size of Alex's hand. He walked up to it and licked his lips in concentration. Brow furrowed and hands closing the distance from his side, Alex waited for the crystal to activate cleansing him of any potential contaminants before he stepped into the pressure-controlled, temperature-regulated and sound-proofed room beyond. He looked so confident before at the information desk, but now, standing in front of the thing, he hesitated. The crystal did not. Sparks of silver light latched onto Alex's arms and poured his hands inward, fixing them to the sides of the crystal. Alex hadn't ever been allowed into this section before and didn't know what to expect. The sparking energy seemed to hang in the air for the briefest of seconds before, finally, it deactivated. Alex released his grip on the crystal, a burnt metallic smell sizzling through the room. A tingling sensation tickled the back of Alex's neck. The red clock was still ticking, and he needed to hurry. The reading room where Alex had brought his treasured volume was short. Four thick pillars held up the low ceiling. There was no heater. There were no chairs. In the center, a pair of large stainless steel tables stood. 
enabling librarians to look over their artifacts off the floor. That was a small consolation, but the overarching theme remained. It was not a place designed for comfort. This room did its best to ward people away, inconvenience those that did come there. Alex scrambled, writing furiously on the notepad he had brought with him. The clock had ticked down to its final minute. It wasn't finished. His normally beautiful, flowing script now looked scrambled and disjointed as Alex tried to copy down everything he could. The clock buzzed. Ten seconds offset it to give absent-minded scholars a reminder they needed to leave. Alex kept scribbling. The architects buried the room in the bowels of the Smithsonian, far from any exits and behind multiple layers of security. Even after Alex had gotten through the crystal room, there were other checkpoints and measures put in place. The relics in there were not just dangerous. The librarians could let them fall into destructive hands, yes. However, the real danger was what would happen if the objects themselves escaped. Alex closed his notepad and sprinted for the exit. It would shut on him if it didn't leave before the time expired, and nothing he could do would open that door which sealed him in. An alarm cracks and blared to life just as Alex's fingers wrapped around the handle. In three short bursts, the room would close. Alex didn't wait around. He pulled hard on the handle and left the room. The third sharp blast echoing its last beat just as the door closed behind him. He laughed. It was a sharp bark, a nervous exhalation, and Alex clutched his notepad to his chest. He hadn't realized just how stressed he had been, but the ticking clock had done its job getting him out on time. The architects designed a section to make it hard to steal the objects secured inside, and to keep them from finding their own ways out. Alex retraced his steps back through the layers of security, still holding his notepad and white knuckles until he made it back to the crystal decontamination room. Here. He had to put the small book on the ground so he could touch the crystal. When he did, this time, there were no bright flashes of lightning or sudden pulling. Instead, Alex felt his body stiff like a limb of a redwood tree. He hadn't made it do that. His fingers were a bare inch from the crystalline surface, but he couldn't move. Was that part of the process on the reverse trip? Alex knew no more than he did coming in. Then something skittered across his back, and Alex felt it travel up onto his shoulder and then around to continue down his right arm. He looked at it and saw what appeared to be a small black beetle. Its carapace shimmered in the harsh lighting and, once it reached the end of his hand, it leaped onto the crystal. The architects designed the room with a singular purpose in mind. Whatever touched the crystal in the room, it deemed safe, and it decided everything else living in the room was dangerous. They had made it to prevent hitchhikers from passing through the security layers. The issue was now Alex had become the hitchhiker, the crystal did its job and removed any contaminants from the room. When the doors opened, the small black beetle scurried out, and there was a light coating of dust floating down towards the floor. Ari, can you, can you come look at this? Lindsay asked. She held a brass set of scales up in the air from a few rows away. Yellow dust lights shone onto the long wooden tables in the south wing, five floors on the ground. There were close to 20 researchers in the room, each cataloging a different relic, and each looked up and shushed Lindsay when she called out. Hmm, what is it? The older woman asked, making her way around the end of the tables. The others didn't raise their heads and didn't shush Ari. Some in the room had been with the organization longer than she, but it wasn't about tenure. Ari had experience. This skull isn't sitting level, but there's nothing on it. Lindsay said when Ari came closer to look. At first, Ari thought it was damaged or uncalibrated. But when she looked closer, there were small etchings on the underside of the base. The etchings were Aramaic, but the scales didn't date from that period. Someone had altered them. Ari took a glove from the table, slipped it on, and took the scales from Lindsay. She noticed immediately there wasn't an even pull to them. It was as though gravity was pushing laterally rather than downwards. When she turned it to look at the other side, the scales tipped again. Something strange was going on. Get them down to the lab, Ari told the junior scholar. Find out when those words were added. Yes, ma'am, Lindsay said, once more respectful, now that she had her instructions. Just as Ari almost made it back to her seat, another researcher, Jeffrey this time, called out. Uh, ma'am, I, I think there's something wrong with this rod. The man's voice squeaked out as though he were fighting himself to speak up. Ari sighed and turned, making her way over to him. Before she got there, Two hands shot up into the air from across the room, 
bollocked by an alarm clock wailing on the next table over. The poor scholar tried in vain to cover the clock's speaker with a hand to silence it. The air seemed to thicken, and a cloud formed in the center of the room above another relic. Something was causing all of them to awaken, perhaps for the first time in centuries. Then, as if answering the question floating in everyone's minds, red light cut on, high above their heads, followed by three short blasts of a siren. Security had just locked down the complex. Something was loose. Ari's eyes went wide, and she ordered all the juniors in the room to stay put, and locked the doors as soon as she left. She didn't wait for them to respond. Each second she delayed could be fatal. By the time Ari made it out of the south wing, there was a palpable tension in the air, as though fear had sunk in. She didn't see many people in the halls. They were hiding. Ari pushed on a small knot in a panel of a wall near the stairwell. A soft click and hiss of air answered her before a hidden door swung open. Stepping through, she saw a bank of computer screens in a darkened room, each scanning through the many cameras within the complex's halls. Standing over them were a pair of researchers whom Ari didn't know, but they bore the same thin line on their lips and squint in their eyes that marked their focus gleaned from hard-fought experience. They were staring at one monitor in particular. What is it? Ari asked, a voice clipped and taut. One of them clicked a key on the board in front of them and pointed up at the screen. Something is loose in the hub, the other said. It was an older man with grey streaks in his hair and laugh lines deep on his face. The hub? She hoped she had misheard him. The older man nodded. Just then the radio on the desk came to life. We've got an injury in the east wing. Second floor down, the voice called. I've got two responders heading that way. Switch to alternate frequency and guide them to the nearest room. Curtis answered. He worked the information desk on the main floor, but in emergencies, he was also the dispatcher. Less than two seconds later, a third voice came over the radio. Help! It screamed, pleading, in an obvious pain. Who is this? Where are you? Curtis called out. Help! I'm, I'm in the hub. It's here. It's attacking us. Please help! Where in the hub? What is attacking you? Curtis asked, but there was no immediate answer. Ari was close to Curtis's station. It was only two floors up, and the stairwell was right outside. She had to help. Give me one of your radios, Ari ordered. The older gentleman pulled open a drawer and fished out a small green brick and tossed it to her. Ari grabbed it and hooked the radio onto her belt. Ari ran to the corner at a sprint, leaning into the turn to maintain good traction on the tiled floor. There were yells and cries coming from up ahead. Whatever it was, was attacking the researchers. It was close now. The door slammed open in front of her on her right so violently it bounced back off the wall with a sharp whack, followed by a soft cloud of dust. Ari made it to the doorway and looked inside. It was at least seven feet tall, with a pair of horns rising further from there. The thing hunched over as it walked. It was fur covering the thick ropes of muscle on its arms. A red-hot glyph burned in the center of its chest. The creature let out its own bellowing roar of challenge at a cowering researcher. The small man hid behind a stainless steel lab table, and he gripped its leg for dear life. Reaching above its head, the creature emitted a black smoke from its hand. After a second, the smoke solidified into a sharp-edged hammer. In one swipe, it smashed the table into a bent and mangled mess. Ari took a microscope off the desk next to her and flung it at the monster's back hoping to distract it and let the man escape. It flew through the air in a perfect arc aimed at the thing's skull, but instead of impacting, it fell straight through it, as though the creature was just as incorporeal as it hammer was a moment before. The creature paid her no mind, and instead reached down to grasp the man by the lapel of his coat. It picked him up while Ari watched, rooted to the spot, desperately looking for something, some weapon that could touch it. She found nothing, and the creature's face elongated like a ball, while its open mouth revealed fangs like a werewolf. It drooled onto the floor in small droplets of acid before it bit the researcher's head off. Ari shouted at the thing. She yelled and threw another microscope. No! But once again, it sailed straight through it, as though the monster wasn't there. This time, however, it turned and faced her directly, it smiled a toothy grin through the shadows and blood coating it, and stalked towards her. She stood her ground, hands up in front of her in a defensive posture, 
The creature ignored them and walked into and through Ari. He passed through her. She spun around, taking a swing at it, only to meet the wall on the far side, bruising her knuckles and sending a shock through her arm. It left the room and turned down the hall towards the center of the Smithsonian's complex, utterly dismissing Ari. She was not a threat. The woman jammed her finger down on the radio's transmit button. What the hell is this thing? You've got it on camera, right? She was on Curtis's private frequency, and she knew he'd be monitoring it. It didn't take but a few seconds before a crackle came through the speaker. Yes, I'm watching it. What you did was extremely ill-advised. I don't give a crap if it was ill-advised. That thing is tearing through people like they're paper dolls, and it's almost to your checkpoint. Ari shot back. Our lockdown measures are in place. We will be fine. Curtis replied. Oh, great. You guys just hide there while whatever this thing is terrorizes the rest of the complex. Tell me you have a lead at least. We've got one, but it's thin. Curtis answered, his voice crackling over a bit of interference. I don't care how thin it is. Just give it to me. A senior researcher reported one of their members missing a few minutes before the lockdown. The person in question had been scheduled to conduct some sensitive research in the hub. (sighs) I'm moving to intercept the creature. Find out what that guy was looking at. Ari said. She sprinted off in the direction the monster had left it. There were lots of things, malignant things, in this world. And for many of them, all a person could do was to get out of their way. Ari hoped this wasn't one of them, or every living person in the complex would end up a corpse. All right, I've pulled the authorization slip. Curtis's voice echoed from the radio on Ari's hip as she raced down the hall under a bank of fluorescent lights, slashed and crackling. He was looking into the lingua superos. His hypothesis was that the words weren't a language to be translated, but a being. He thought the words were alive. Ari's heart pounded as she redoubled her speed around another corner. Words mean nothing if there isn't someone around to read them, she said. There was a dark red smear on the ground leading into another side room, but the place was silent. It had already come and gone. Why was the lingua superos under lock and key? She asked into the radio. My notes just say that perception is its reality, he replied. Ari burst through a pair of double doors into the main hall of the hub. There were shelves knocked over, the relics scattered all over the floor. Some priceless artifacts of long dead nations lay in ruinous rubble in the corners of the chamber. A scream cut through the air from close by and far away all at once. Ari's eyes shot open wide. She continued her sprint through the underground passages. The scream had come from up ahead and over her radio at the same time. The creature, the lingua superos, had breached the hub's security center. If it was indeed more powerful as it is perceived, and it removed the complex's lockdown, then it could escape. In this age of digital technology, where everyone has a camera and the internet in their pocket, once this thing got out, it would eat the world. She made it to the security checkpoint only seconds after it had torn through it, along its rampage. The creature was staring down at Curtis, who lay on the ground with his hands pressed hard against a red gash across his stomach. There were bits of flesh and smoking security uniforms coating every surface. Ari almost blindly rushed in again, but something stopped her. Curtis lay there facing the monster, with his eyes shut tight. Curtis, run! No! He yelled back. Quickly, Ari, shut your eyes! It can't hurt us if we can't see it! Are you crazy? It'll rip you in half. There was a discarded pistol on the ground next to her, and she picked it up. Leveling the barrel at the back of the lingua superos's head, she pulled the trigger and let off three quick rounds. They flew through the beast and took out a computer monitor on the far side in a shower of sparks. It reached back above its head, and smoke emitted once again from its hand. Once again a large mole appeared in them, and once again it tensed to bring it to bear against its intended victim. This time, Ari hoped it would be different. Curtis was an arse and a stickler for procedure, but he wasn't stupid. As the blow fell, she closed her eyes. For a long, agonizing moment, she heard nothing. There was no crunch of bone, crash of hammer, or the squelch of flesh. She heard only Curtis's belabored exhalations. Ari finally opened her eyes, but the creature was nowhere in sight. Curtis struggled to stand up, but he managed while holding a white-knuckled grip on the desk next to him. Ari helped ease him down into a chair. Where'd it go? She asked. It left to look for someone else to kill. 
If no one is looking at it, it's effectively neutered. You almost got me killed stumbling in here like that. How did you know that? Ari asked. Well, I didn't. But it was working, wasn't it? Curtis replied, grimacing in pain from the slash in his belly. <sighs> you still got hurt. That was from one of these morons, rest their souls. Not the lingua superos. Listen, you've got to get into the research hub where the book is. Get in there, destroy the thing. If we remove the words, there's nothing tethering it to its physical form, right? Ari stared at him for a moment, thinking the idea over. You're sure that'll work? Curtis shook his head. Who knows, but this did. Look, it's the best shot we have. Get going and I'll clean this mess up. Curtis tossed Ari a lighter. She caught it easily in one hand. Burn that thing to cinders. Ari nodded and left the security point, heading back into the maze of passages. The decontamination room's door came into sight around a bend in the corner. Stepping inside, Ari didn't see any security. The room felt still and dead. There were small parts of ash sitting against the wall flanking the entrance. The door was well lit with a dull pink light, warning off anyone from accidentally entering. She didn't think twice and ripped it open. The crystal stood hovering where it always was. Ari raced up to it and touched its cool surface. There was a flash and a hiss, but nothing else happened. She moved into the next room and through more layers of security, she saw more small piles of ash and put the pieces together. There would be a reckoning soon. Ari was going to destroy this thing for hurting so many. Burning a book has a stigma about it, but when one became an unstoppable creature, tearing people apart, Ari's scruples disappeared entirely. Flying through the last remaining doors, Ari made it to the reading room. There were two others already here. They stood hunched over something on a table in the center of the room, and even from behind, Ari recognized the figures. It was the two junior scholars, Jeffrey and Lindsay. How they had made it to the room alive, in one piece, was a shock. Beyond even that, the two had somehow worked out the same idea as Ari had, but without the benefit of Curtis's records check. It was impressive. How? Ari asked. The two scholars jumped at the sound of her voice. They had been so entranced, even the sound of the door hadn't shaken their attention. Oh, it's you, Lindsay said. Here, come look at this. Ari stepped up between the two juniors to gaze down at what had held their rapt attention. It was a large book, open to a page full of text Ari couldn't decipher, but it didn't take her long to realize what she was looking at. There was a glyph missing from one line of text. It had left a shadow of inky residue between two others. She'd seen a glyph matching that shadow before. It was the one that had glowed on the face of the creature. This book was the lingua superos. How did you find this? How... how did you know? Ari asked. The two scholars first looked at each other, and then back to Ari, confusion clear on their faces. We came here looking for answers. There's something monstrous out there, and it's tearing people apart. Jeffrey said. Lindsay cut in, pointing down to the open lingua. This was just sitting here when we arrived. We don't know what it is, but that spot has a missing letter. If you look closely, it matches the one on the monster. I noticed that too. Ari finished. Lindsay nodded. We're hoping to find some way of banishing the monster, but we couldn't make heads or tails of it. That was until a few minutes ago. That piqued Ari's interest. You can read this? She said, pointing down to the thick leather-bound book. Well, sort of. Jeffrey said. It's as though the words are rearranging themselves in our heads. We looked one page over when we first got here, and then looked at it again a few minutes later. Only the second time, Lindsay could pick out some words. It'd be exciting if it were under other circumstances, Lindsay said, and she looked down at the lingua. Like here, it talks about the beginning of the worlds. Or words. We're not sure yet, but I know we'll get it. We just need more time. That monster out there is ripping the place to shreds. We don't have more time, Ari said. There was an edge in her voice. She was impatient, and it was though there was a solution sitting just out of reach. We know. We're just trying to figure out how to stop it, Jeffrey said his eyes flicking over to Lindsay. What I'm saying, Ari said, trying hard to keep her voice even, is that research is great and all, but at some point, you just have to act. This monster was born from the lingua. Maybe there's still a link there. Lindsay blinked a few times at them, as though the thought had never occurred to her. Jeffrey snapped his fingers. Yes, like there's a way to bring it here and bind it back into the book. I was thinking more like burn its house down with it inside. Ari replied dryly, 
pulling out the lighter Curtis had given her. No! Lindsay shouted and jumped between the book and Ari's lighter, her hands held out in front of her. What's wrong? Ari asked and tried to step around her. You can't do that! She shouted. We would lose the book forever! That is the point. Ari replied. Jeffrey stepped to the side, avoiding both women's gaze. What if there's a better way to destroy the monster? Lindsay said. She hadn't moved from between the book and her mentor. Although I applaud your conviction, we do not have the time to spend looking for another way. Jeffrey took another step, this time backwards. I can't. You mustn't destroy it. Ari paused at this. Something was off. Why was Jeffrey backing away? Why would Lindsay go against her like this when she hadn't ever done that before? How did the two of them make it past the creature roaming the halls? I can only exist when it's perceived. She muttered, realization dawning. It took you long enough, Lindsay said, her voice pitched deeper, with discordant notes ringing out from every corner of the room. Jeffrey had inched close enough to reach for the door. He tried to make it, but Lindsay was faster. She hadn't even needed to move. Her arm became a shadow in an instant, growing to ten feet and snatching Jeffrey from his attempted escape. No! He cried. You promised you'd let me live if I tempted another person to take my place! Lindsay made a pouting face. Oh. She said. That's That's too bad. What? Jeffrey asked, his eyes wide in terror. (laughs) I lied. Lindsay said with a smile, and, in one swift motion, she crushed Jeffrey's windpipe. He fell to the floor in a heap, but only stayed there. For a moment, Lindsay cooed, smiling, and arched her back. It cracked once, and she shipped. As she did so, Jeffrey's body dissolved into a soft cloud of ash. That was delicious, Lindsay said, lifting her eyes to meet Ari's hard gaze. What did you do with Lindsay? Ari asked. Her voice was even and deadly calm. Oh, doesn't that sound like a threat? The creature teased. Its voice sounded deep and sultry. Its eyes, Lindsay's eyes, looked out at Ari as though they were admiring an expensive steak. What did you do with Lindsay? Ari repeated slowly, enunciating each word through gritted teeth. The creature cackled. Isn't this just exquisite? I just love language. I love the emotion, the fire. You can bring to someone's eyes with just the right sounds in just the right order. The beast shivered again, its eyes rolling back in its head, and an ecstatic smell slithered its way across her features. Words like... trailed off for a second. The monster opened its eyes and stared into Ari's. I tore her soul from her body, eviscerated her organs, and burned her from the inside. In any other moment of existence, she wouldn't have been able to pull it off. But in that place, with the lingua in front of her, and the inferno raging behind her eyes, Ari was faster than the monster. She pulled the gun out she had kept from the security station, and fired three rounds right between Lindsay's eyes. Her head snapped back unnaturally far, and the figure stood there for a brief second, wavering, and it collapsed to the floor. Ari moved toward the book, but she didn't make it. With his head still flipped backwards, a hand reached out and pulled on Ari's leg, tripping her. The letter flew from her hand and skittered off across the room into the corner. Ari looked back at the figure holding her leg. It wore Lindsay's skin like a suit of flesh and bone, but the light had long since left Lindsay's eyes. Ari kicked at it, breaking the monster's grip as she jerked upright, lunging for the light. The lingua crawled after her, head flopping limply, and a small trail of oozing blood leaving a smear as she moved. Lindsay's shirt had lifted slightly in the struggle, and Ari saw a gash across her stomach. The lingua superos hadn't exaggerated. She kicked it one more time and snatched the lighter. Ari tried to move back towards the table, but the lingua stood in her way. It reached for her, black shadowy arms extending from Lindsay's dead limbs. They grabbed her and drug her towards it. Any second now, the monster would kill her the same way it killed Jeffrey. She only had one option. Ari closed her eyes. And just like that, the shadowy extensions of Lindsay's arms were gone. The flesh was real, but the thing controlling it still had to obey its laws. Keeping her eyes shut, Ari dove back toward the center of the room. She hit the table and kicked her legs up and over, sliding across its top to grab the book. The pages were ancient and bone dry. Ari opened her eyes to see the lingua looking at her. Its face looked on in a silent, desperate plea for mercy. 
Ari clicked the light at once, and then again. Finally, on the third try, a small flame licked up the side of the page, went up in a fireball of ink and leather binding. No! The link was screamed from dead lips. No, you can't. How could you? Its screams turned into cries. Smoke coiled out of Lindsay's mouth and from the gash in her stomach. It coalesced in the air above her like a thundercloud until, finally, devoid of its animating force, Lindsay's body crumpled onto the ground next to Jeffrey's ashes. The cloud sparked and raged as the book burned. It formed back into the shape of the great horned beast with a glyph. Its screams seemed heavier, harsher, and more primal in this form. But slowly, as the book dissolved into an ashen heap, the monster's cries turned into laughter. You... It should have killed you. You're supposed to be gone. It was supposed to work. Ari said in a breathless whisper. The monster clapped its clawed hands together. It gave Ari a wolfish grin, pulling back its lips to reveal dripping fangs. <laughs> you really thought burning that book would end me? The lingua replied. If it wasn't dangerous, why fight me for it? Why didn't you just kill me? Oh, it doesn't understand. That's so sad. You've had so many chances, and you turned away from me each time. Why? The creature leaned its head back and howled with laughter. It finally got control of itself after a time and looked Ari in the eye. Watching you struggle was just so inspiring. As the monster said the words, Ari knew there was no escape for her, and there was no escape for anyone alive in the complex. A hundred souls or more had come down to work here today, and none would ever see the sun again. What do you want? Ari asked. The lingua sniffed the air. I want what every living thing wants. I want to eat. It has been so long since I've eaten. I'm starving. I think I could eat the world. It stepped closer hunched over Lindsay's body, and took one claw down to dip it in her blood. It licked its fingers, and the glyph on its face flared in a sudden bright light. You can't get out. I locked the whole place down. There's nowhere for you to go. Oh, you sad little girl. It said. I will break your mind, then you will let me out. Ari didn't look away from the creature. She reached down and picked up the radio from its place clipped to her belt. Curtis? She said into it. Her voice was even, calm, and final. Destroy the exit. No one gets out. There was a slight pause, but then the speaker came to life. It said one word. Uh, understood. The Limbra Superus did all it said it would and more. It was hungry, and it ate every living thing inside the complex except one. Someone must see the lingua to exist. It held Ari alive in a waking nightmare, peeled off her eyelids, and kept her chained to its side. It shattered her mind and her sanity. It made her watch as it devoured each person. Then, when the monster finally finished, the lingua gave Ari a steady stream of its power, slowly infecting her with sustenance and keeping her alive. It shifted in its form to suit its needs from a cloud of smoke to any of a thousand monstrous and nightmarish creatures all to keep itself entertained by Ari's screams until it found a way out. It was the most patient creature in existence, and it could wait until the end of time. All the while, it would keep Ari alive and with it. And thus, the story is ended. The tale told. The chapter closed. Well, Dark Valiance, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to know what happens to Ari and the SRC, I guess you'll just have to hit that follow button, won't you? This story, Labyrinthine Shades, was written by Devin McCamey. Our narrator is Jeremiah John. The voice of Ari is Ariska Redding. Alex was voiced by Devin McCamey. The man who brought Curtis to life was Gorath Hyun. Lindsay was voiced by the always spectacular Rosie Knuckles. And the voice of Jeffrey was Brandon McCamey. Our audio engineering was expertly crafted by Michael G., and our bespoke artwork for this chapter was drawn by Brandon McCamey. Our media manager is Jonathan Capers. Thank you for listening. And, if you enjoyed this story and want to show your support with a modest contribution, you can find this story and other exclusive tales on our Patreon page. 
Lastly, join us in our community Discord server to hear about news, events, and giveaways like signed copies of the book. The links are down below. Thank you.